Well, uh, I'm going to talk about some line of work, which is, in a sense, a sort of um, a continuation of, of a line of work uh, we started with Sparta, uh, well, quite a long time ago, uh, well, more than 10 years ago now. Um, well, it's, uh, so the, actually the, the, reason, um, the reason I first talked to Parta um, is, um, well, it, it was due to actually um, some sort of convoluted argument. Uh, pay, well, it was uh, she and Malik's paper on uh, image segmentation, which is a very nice paper, very insightful. But the argument for the, um, how to derive clustering was a little bit convoluted and it was hard to get through it. And uh, while well, I was, in fact, we were talking with uh, John Goldsmith about uh, um, automatic part of speech um, clustering, and I was reading that paper, and I just couldn't figure out what it was, how, to, how to sort of, how to deal with this argument. And um, so I thought, well, I knew that Parte had just come at that time. He was new faculty in computer science, and I thought, well, maybe I would ask him. Maybe he happens to know about that. And so I went to him, and he actually didn't know about that paper, but um, it was sort of, I think it was very typical of him. He was very, as many, many people said, he was very generous with his time, and he, you know, we started reading the paper and sort of meeting and discussing it. And, um, well, we understood the argument eventually. But what is interesting is that um, uh, it, he was, at that point, the manifold learning, uh, the first two manifold learning papers, uh, Isomap and LLA, had just come out. It literally was like a month earlier or something like that. And uh, Parta was aware of that. I, I wasn't. Um, and then Parta said, well, maybe there is a connection here. We should think about it. And well, we started thinking about it. And it turned into a line of work which went on for, you know, for a long time. And um, I think this is very typical of Parta. It's sort of this mixture of in, you know, um, generosity, uh, serendipity, insight, it kind of uh, all put together. Yeah, it was interesting because uh, Parvati said Parta was concerned that he may not have students. And uh, uh, I, I think uh, to me he was just an uh, amazing advisor and friend, and I think to, to all of his students as well. Um, well, in any case, so. Um, so this is uh, what I want to talk about a little bit is um, this is a joint work with um, Chi Chao Chue, who is, uh, who is here, and Yu Su Wong, and Chui Yong Zhou, who is uh, maybe also here. Um, and uh, um, so the idea was to sort of um, take a little bit um, sort of to uh, go a little bit beyond the manifold assumption. And I think at this point, it is clear that the manifold assumption, uh, well, what is the manifold assumption? There, was, um, there were many talks which mentioned, but it's the idea that uh, the data lies on some high dimensional, on some low dimensional manifold in a high dimensional space. And I think that this point for many domains, it is sort of uncontroversial that there are many types of data which is which are on a manifold. And well, it kind of comes out naturally if you have any continuous dependence on parameters, right? That it will generate a manifold. Um, so uh, many algorithms are based on this assumption and it, it does reflect a lot of data, but it doesn't reflect a certain phenomenon, phenomena. Uh, so um, why is it good? Well, the manifold assumption provides a very clean mathematical formulation for the analysis of algorithm. You have a very classical mathematical object, and in many situations it's a very plausible model. And you have a sort of clean mathematical way of analyzing it, dealing with it, and you have the sort of machinery of <laughs> mathematics which, you know, mathematicians spend hundreds of years developing. Um, but what would be nice is to go a little bit beyond it, and actually Steve talked about it uh, in his talk, 
about um, going for like Ale Alexander spaces, Alexander spaces, uh, and uh, um, what we do here, we uh, take a specific kind of phenomenon. It's a much more restricted set of manifolds, but we do get uh, uh, also a sort of quite precise analysis in terms of uh, how the manifold, uh, how the Laplacian-based manifold learning algorithms behave on this. So, what kind of uh, spaces do we want to consider? Well. Um, Basically, what we consider are three types of singularities. One type is the intersection. Intersection type, you have two manifolds and they intersect. This actually, I'll, I'll, I'll say something why this may be reasonable. So one, one case is the intersection time, you have two manifolds that intersect. Another case is an edge type. You know, there is a kind of, you fold a sheet of paper and there is a sharp angle. And, um, and the final case is a boundary, which is maybe not really, a, I don't know whether you would consider it a single, it is some sort of singularity. In any case, it's convenient to consider it to be a singularity. Um, what can, um, why, why, is that, why are these things reasonable? And why in some sense, I think many phenomena, maybe it may be enough to describe certainly many things, not everything certainly, but many things. Um, Well, imagine that, well, first boundary, is, it's, uh, well, if you have a limited configuration space like a joint, right, you immediately have a boundary. The joint can go to a certain angle. It cannot go very much below, uh, beyond that. What about intersection type? Well, again, I think in classification, this is the most natural uh, of, um, interse of singularity. Why? Well, you have different classes, and the hard cases are those which look like they may belong to either class. This is actually a seven, this is a one, but it's kind of hard to tell. So in some sense, if you want to classify things, then you very naturally, well, if you don't have a sing, uh, something like this, then it's probably an easy problem. If you just have completely different manifolds. If seven and ones are completely different, probably wouldn't be that hard to, to separate them. The probably really hard cases are the ones which are like that. And um, well, edge type is kind of, you can think of them as being edge transitions. It's in sort of machine learning, it's not so clear where they appear. Well, they kind of appear when there is a sudden change in some direction. But I think in things like graphics, they're extremely natural because anything which has a sharp corner is edge type. So this are the singularity and the goal is to study how singularities influence uh, sort of learning understanding of data. So um, so let me just remind you very briefly, I, I think uh, you have probably seen this picture or something like that. But um, so the idea is, well, you want to construct a graph which describes a manifold. And the graph is constructed from data. And how do you do, how do, you do it? You take your point cloud, connect points which are nearby, and that kind of serves as a proxy, as some sort of cartoon for the underlying manifold. So that's a model for the underlying manifold. The underlying manifolds may be this. This graph is some sort of, you know, um, empirical object corresponding to that. Uh, now, uh, well, what do you, what, what is the actual object? The object is the graph Laplacian, the object of interest. Um, at least in this discussion. And um, you basically, you take, it's a weighted graph whose weights are the Gaussian on the distances between these points. Now, if you apply it to a function, it looks like something like this. So this is, you can take this to be the definition of the weighted graph Laplacian. And, uh, um, well, what is the nice thing about it? The nice thing about it is that it, uh, well, let me just go to this one. It actually, um, it converges to the true Laplace operate manifold. So, oh, wait. Sorry, what is the actual, uh, yeah. Yeah, it converges to the actual Laplace and 
Laplace operator on the manifold, and uh, well, we were, we were uh, well, we and uh, a number of other people uh, worked on this, including uh, uh, Amit is here, uh, including Amit, and uh, um, there are certain types of convergence, and one of them is uh, sort of point once one is spectral. Um, and basically, the, uh, the point is that this uh, empirical object converges to the true Laplace operator on the manifold. And uh, Laplace operator on the manifold has many useful applications in terms of both mathematically and in terms of data analysis, starting from some you know, solving uh, you know, partial differential equations like the heat equation to uh, you know, various representations of the manifold. So now um, the question uh, in about the singular spaces is what happens to the Laplace operator when there is a singularity? So suppose you have one of those types of singularities and the question is, so inside the domain we know pretty well, it just converges to the usual Laplace Beltrami operator, which is, uh, you know, something like the second derivative, essentially, or s sum of the second derivative. What is happening near the singularity? Well, at a regular point, so you get just the ordinary uh, Laplace operator, and, you know, if you write what is happening here, well, can write the expansion, right? What do you have? You have a tail expansion has the, you know, the constant term. So this is, imagine I have a point on a manifold. This is y is not too far from x. It has a gradient term and it has a second order term which is a Hessian. And what is happening on the manifold is that when you're actually writing out the graph Laplace operator, I'm going, I'm not going to sort of do it this in detail, but roughly speaking, you have something which is an integral of a gradient and an integral of this guy, of the Hessian. And the integral of the gradient kind of, ma well, basically, I don't know. But it disappears because the function is basically, it's like integrating a, an odd function, right? The integral of an odd function is zero. That's what is happening. And when you integrate the Hessian, what you are getting is actually the trace of the Hessian, which happens to be exactly the Laplace. So that's very roughly in two words the idea of why you're getting the Laplace. Of course, I'm not talking about geodesic coordinates or anything like that, which you have to do if you really want to do this carefully on the manifold. Now, what happens at a singularity? So this, is, uh, this quantity is basically trace of the hash. What happens near singularity? Near singularity, um, something quite different happens. Uh, well, you can think that near singularity, this term, doesn't disappear, and you actually have a term with a gradient left on it. And here is the interesting thing. First, it's a tail expansion. Well, in this case, the singularity is, a, is just a boundary to make it very simple. Uh, because it's a gradient, because the first term with the gradient doesn't disappear, this is a higher order term in the tail expansion. This order term is going to actually dominate. So this term has much higher weight than the term. I mean, of course, you still have the, the second order term, but this is going to be something of the, or, uh, this are going to be of different orders. And again, from this picture, it's not completely clear, but if you do this correctly, write it out, you will see that these terms are of different orders. So what you are having here is that if this is a one of square root of the, so for the boundary is the simplest case, you have something like over one of a square root of t, the t is the bandwidth of the Gaussian, times the, the normal derivative. And if you compare this to the, um, you know, in point inside the manifold, so here you have one over square root t, you have, you have constant. Well, when t is small, this is much, much larger. So that's a key observation, one of the key observations. And... Uh, it turns out, again, let me, maybe I'll, well, okay, there is another interesting observation about what is happening. Because you have a kernel, you actually have the following behavior. You have this um, sort of Laplace operator, again, this has a bandwidth t, near the boundary, 
it has uh, some sort of effective radius. And this effective radius is controlled by the square root of t. So it, I think uh, it's kind of parallel when you have a random walk, you know, in time t, you kind of go square root of t away. That's, I guess, the sort of analogous thing to this. So what you have, you have some sort of fast decay around the boundary when it decays up to the, up to the distance square root of t. And after that, it basically disappears because this Gaussian kicks in. So you have something quite large at the boundary, then it quickly decays away. Square root of t away from the boundary is gone. Of course, it's not really square root of t. It's a little bit bigger. That's the idea. Um, so as x moves away from the boundary, the boundary effect decreases rapidly. And how does it decrease? It decreases on a scale of square root of t. And uh, yeah, so let me skip this. Now, what about the intersection? Well, with the intersection, it's actually very, uh, it's a little bit more complicated, but to the first order, it's the same thing. So again, you know, you don't have to worry about this complicated formula. The basic thing is that, well, the scaling behavior is exactly the same, the sort of, Decay is similar, not exactly the same, but very similar. It's still a Gaussian. But here is the interesting thing. Well, what is the difference? When you're near the boundary, you, uh, you have only one derivative, normal derivative. It's very simple. When you're near an intersection, you have two derivatives, right? You have two directions. You kind of have directions in this and that, along the first manifold and the second manifold. So now it's not going to be just one thing. It's going to be a sum of these two normal derivatives. And uh, finally, near the edge singularity, it's actually the actual formula is even more complicated. But uh, again, you have the same phenomenon. There are two derivatives, one against the first sheet, the second against the second sheet. And this, uh, and this basically adapts to some coefficients. Um, okay, so why is this interesting? So, okay, so far I showed some formulas and so on. Maybe this is, uh, you know, wh what is the sort of take home message from this? Well, I think one take home message is that, so there, there are, I think, a few take home messages which may be interesting. But one take home message, well, the scaling is very different. So when you actually, uh, you know, apply this to a function, this will look very different. This, this dominate, right, near the, near the boundary. So that suggests that potentially one can identify singularities by applying this to, um, by applying this to a function and looking for where it behaves, kind of where the values are very large. So that's kind of, uh, it's a little bit similar, I guess, to you know, learning uh, things like stratify spaces with, uh, with Cheyenne has been working on uh, where you want to identify the strata. Here you may want to identify the singularities, well, or boundaries. That would be one way to do this. Um, let me just skip this. So here is a sort of example for this. Uh, well, it's not completely clear what this is. This is actually um, a surface. And uh, it's, um, I think it's a well-known model. Um, and uh, now the Laplacian constructed from this point cloud is applied to a, to a coordinate function, and this has a large values of the Laplacian, right? And the large values, of course, well, they should correspond to the edges and to, you know, things like corners and so on, and which is what we see. Here is another point. Um, well, around different type of singularities, scaling behaviors are different. And again, this is not, uh, well, you have to stare at the formula for you know, a few seconds to realize this. I just went through it very quickly. But yeah, it kind of very roughly, you can think boundary, you just have a straight decay. Intersection, you have something much more, well, it's different. You have a kind of up and down behavior. 
So that scaling to the minus r squared near the boundary is just e to the minus r squared. Near the intersection is something like r times e to the minus r squared. And near the edge is some sort of combination of the things. So well, that suggests that you may be able to distinguish boundary from intersection. And uh, yeah, I mean, this is a numerical example where actually it works. So this, this is my manifold. This is a singular manifold, just this a union of the three lines. It has a corner. It has three points which are boundaries. And it has an intersection. And this is the value applied to some function of uh, just along this line. So you can see that at this point it's very large. At this point it goes kind of up and down. And at this point it just goes straight up. So exactly what we, what we should see from the, um, you know, from the math. Uh, here is another thing. It's a, it's a union of a bunny. So this is a famous uh, Stanford bunny model. Now this is probably the most famous bunny in the world. <laughs> <laughs> It's, um, so yeah, I think it's something like 10,000 data points from sampled from the surface. And um, union with this plane intersecting it. And you can see that when you apply Laplacian to a coordinate function, you get this up and down behavior. The blue means down, this is a low one. This, this kind of red means up. So. And, uh, Finally, uh, well, not finally, sorry. Uh, this is point three. Can singularities be simply ignored after this points of measure zero, right? Well, it's a boundary or whatever, singularity intersection. Measure zero, right? We can ignore them because you never actually see those points in data. Right? You never sample from measure zero. So. Well, actually, no, because in some sense it's measure zero, but the the contribution of this is one of a square. So if you think about it, you have a set of co-dimension one. But it's not just a set which can influence. It has something like square root of t around the set. It's like really, really like a cylinder around the set. So the volume of the cylinder is, well, it's one of a square root of t times, you know, uh, the whatever, the co-dimension one volume of the actual boundary. Well, you can say, well, it's very small. It's something on the order of square root of t. However, the contribution of this, guys, if you just simply integrate, it's square root of t. Well, 1 over square root of t times square root of t is 1. So it's all of 1 contribution. It's a constant. Cannot be ignored. If you take L2 norm, then you're going to actually be squaring this 1 over square root of t, so it's even larger. So it's infinite. Um, So you can also try to uh, compute outward bound, uh, normals using this, but I'll just skip this. So finally, let me point out what are the implications for eigenfunctions. So we cannot yet prove this. It may be hard because even the convergence of eigenfunctions, um, so yeah, well, Parte and I we worked on this, and we spent actually a long time thinking about it. It's, it's complicated even for the interior case, and we were able to show it, but I think it's a, it wasn't easy. Um, in this case, it's even harder because you have this kind of things which go to infinity. And uh, it looks like it probably is harder to do. But at least there are clear sort of lessons from this. And the la uh, or, or things which seem like they must be true. Um, well, first, uh, well, if it's a boundary, what is happening? Well, you have this kind of expansion at the boundary. And on one hand side, on the other hand side, if it's to be an eigenfunction, well, it basically has to be that, so remember this operator near the boundary is a normal derivative, and it's scaling differently from the way the operator is scaling everywhere else. So what is the conclusion? Well, if you want to have an eigenfunction, so you can think of the theorems, can, this theorems, quote unquote theorems in the sense that if there is nice eigenfunctions convergence, then this is not hard to prove. However, the, to prove that eigenfunctions actually converge is non-trivial. So this, this is a conditional, uh, conditional result in a sense. Um, but uh, so what is happening is that if you have something which explodes near the boundary, it, it better be that this thing compensates for it 
that means that the normal derivative needs to be zero, so this would be Neumann boundary condition. Um, and it seems that numerical results are sort of consistent with that. Uh, now, well, if it's edge type singularity, actually, it's really interesting because it appears, and I don't want to talk about this in any detail because I think I'm nearly out of time, but, um, um, well, what is happening, actually, if you look at the boundary, the derivative must match. So it looks like what is happening is that eigenvalues and eigenfunctions of two isometric singular manifolds, when they have the singularity, the edge singularity, must be the same, which is quite surprising, I think. Uh, why? Well, we did some experiments. Uh, what are the experiments? Uh, well, well, the simplest, basically, you just take a rectangle and then you take a corner, make, just, you know, fold it a little bit and compare the eigenvectors. Notice, this is very drastic, actually, transformation because the distances near the singularity are changed by a huge amount, right? They're just way off. These distances and these distances are completely different. Yet, I mean, in some sense, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's an Alexander space, right, all the all the geodesics are somehow preserved. So, uh, uh, so the, I mean, they, they are asymmetric, the spaces. But, uh, but the Laplace operator is completely different. Well, if we just look at the um, patterns of eigenfunctions, so this, this I just plotted eigenfunctions from 2 to um, 17. They're exactly the same. So the fact that you have this fault doesn't matter. And another example is a sphere. You can chop off the top of the sphere, glue it upside down. Well, it's a little hard to visualize eigenfunctions of the sphere because you have multiplicities. But you can actually look at eigenvalues, and eigenvalues are, this has a differences between relative eigenvalues. And you can see that actually eigenvalues, well, it looks like large, but actually if you look at the scale, it's like 1% off. It's very similar. Okay, so let me summarize. Uh, so in some sense, this is the initial study of what happens to the graph Laplacian on singular manifolds and an argument that certain type of singular manifolds are naturally correspond to what we would probably expect to observe in, uh, you know, specific phenomena. And uh, we analyze behavior of functions and there are some potential applications which basically deal with identifying corners, identifying singularities, and maybe understanding the data a little bit better, sort of trying to figure out what can be what can be done with us. Okay. <coughs>